Vilhjalmer Stefansson. Vilhjalmer Stefansson, Icelandic, Vilhjalmer Stefansson, November 3, 1879, August 26, 1962, was an Icelandic American Arctic explorer and ethnologist. He was born in Manitoba, Canada, and died at the age of 82. Early life Stefansson, born William Stevenson, was born at Arnis, Manitoba, Canada, in 1879. His parents had emigrated from Iceland to Manitoba two years earlier. After losing two children during a period of devastating flooding, the family moved to North Dakota in 1880. He was educated at the Universities of North Dakota and of Iowa, A.B., 1903. During his college years, in 1899, he changed his name to Vilhjalmer Stephenson. He studied anthropology at the Graduate School of Harvard University, where for two years he was an instructor. Early Explorations In 1904 and 1905, Stephenson did archaeological research in Iceland. Recruited by Engineer Mikkelsen and Ernest de Coven Leffingwell for their Anglo-American polar expedition, he lived with the Inuit of the Mackenzie Delta during the winter of 1906-1907, returning alone across country via the Porcupine and Yukon Rivers. Dot under the auspices of the American Museum of Natural History New York, he and Dr. R. M. Anderson undertook the ethnological survey of the central Arctic coasts of the shores of North America from 1908 to 1912. In 1908, Stephenson made a decision that would affect the rest of his time in Alaska. He hired the Inuk guide Nat Kuziak, who would remain with him as his primary guide for the rest of his Alaska expeditions. At the time he met Nat Kuziak, the Inuk guide was working for Captain George B. Levitt, a Massachusetts whaling ship captain and friend of Stephenson's who sometimes brought the Arctic explorer replenishments of supplies from the American Museum of Natural History. Christian Klingenberg is first credited to have introduced the term blonde Eskimo to Stephenson just before Stephenson's visit to the Inuit inhabiting southwestern Victoria Island, Canada, in 1910. Stephenson, though, preferred the term Copper Inuit. Adolphus Greeley in 1912 first compiled the sightings recorded in earlier literature of blonde or fair-haired Arctic natives and in 1912 published them in the National Geographic magazine entitled The Origin of Stephenson's Blonde Eskimo. Dot newspapers subsequently popularized the term blonde Eskimo, which caught more readers' attention despite Stephenson's preference for the term copper Inuit. Stephenson later referenced Greeley's work in his writings and the term blonde Eskimo became applied to sightings of light-haired Eskimos from as early as the 17th century. Loss of the Karlik and Rescue of Survivors Stephenson organized and directed the Canadian Arctic Expedition 1913-1916 to explore the regions west of Perry Archipelago for the Government of Canada. Three ships, the Karlik, the Mary Sachs, and the Alaska were employed. Stephenson left the main ship, the Karlik, when it became stuck in the ice in August-September 1913. Stephenson's explanation was that he and five other expedition members left to go hunting to provide fresh meat for the crew. However, William Laird McKinley and others left on the ship suspected that he left deliberately, anticipating that the ship would be carried off by moving ice, as indeed happened. The ship, with Captain Robert Bartlett of Newfoundland and 24 other expedition members aboard, drifted westward with the ice and was eventually crushed. It sank on January 11, 1914. Four men made their way to Harold Island, but died there, possibly from carbon monoxide poisoning, before they could be rescued. Four other men, including Alistair Mackay who had been part of the Sir Ernest Shackleton's British Antarctic Expedition, tried reaching Vrongel Island on their own but perished. The remaining members of the expedition, under command of Captain Bartlett, made their way to Vrongel Island where three died. Bartlett and his Enoch hunter Kataktovic made their way across sea ice to Siberia to get help. Remaining survivors were picked up by the American fishing schooner King and Winge and the United States Revenue Cutter Service Cutter USRC Bear. Stephenson resumed his explorations by sledge over the Arctic Ocean, here known as the Beaufort Sea, leaving Collinson Point, Alaska in April, 1914. Data supporting sledge turned back 75 miles, 121 kilometers, offshore but he and two men continued onward on one sledge, living largely by his rifle on polar game for 96 days until his party reached the Mary Sachs in the autumn. Stephenson continued exploring until 1918. Vrongel Island Fiasco In 1921, he encouraged and planned an expedition for four young men to colonize Vrongel Island north of Siberia, where the 11 survivors of the 22 men on the Karlik had lived from March to September 1914. 
Stephenson had designs for forming an exploration company that would be geared towards individuals interested in touring the Arctic island. Stephenson originally wanted to claim Brongel Island for the Canadian government. However, due to the dangerous outcome from his initial trip to the island, the government refused to assist with the expedition. He then wanted to claim the land for Britain but the British government rejected this claim when it was made by the young men. The raising of the British flag on Brongel Island, an acknowledged Russian territory, caused an international incident. The four young men, Frederick Maurer, Elar Knight, and Milton Gall from the US, and Alan Crawford of Canada, were inexperienced and ill-equipped for the trip. All perished on the island or in an attempt to get help from Siberia across the frozen Chukchi Sea. The only survivors were a Nenook woman, Ada Blackjack, whom the men had hired as a seamstress in Nome, Alaska, and taken with him, and the expedition's cat, Vic. Ada Blackjack had taught herself survival skills and cared for the last man on the island, Elor Knight, until he died of scurvy. Blackjack was rescued in 1923 after two years on Vrongil Island. Stephenson drew the ire of the public and the families for having sent such ill-equipped young men to Vrongil. His reputation was severely tainted by this disaster and that of the Karlik. Discoveries Stephenson's discoveries included new land, such as Brock, Mackenzie King, Borden, Megan, and Lougheed Islands, and the edge of the continental shelf. His journeys and successes are among the marvels of Arctic exploration. He extended the discoveries of Francis Leopold McClintock. From April 1914 to June 1915 he lived on the ice pack. Stephenson continued his explorations leaving from Herschel Island on August 23, 1915. In 1921, he was awarded the Founders Gold Medal of the Royal Geographical Society for his explorations of the Arctic. Later career Stephenson remained a well-known explorer for the rest of his life. Late in life, through his affiliation with Dartmouth College, he was director of Polar Studies, he became a major figure in the establishment of the U.S. Army's Cold Regions Research and Engineering Laboratory, Krull, in Hanover, New Hampshire. Krull's supported research, often conducted in winter on the forbidding summit of Mount Washington, has been key to developing materiel and doctrine to support Alpine conflict. Stephenson joined the Explorers Club in 1908, four years after its founding. He later served as club president twice, 1919 to 1922 and 1937 to 1939. In the all-male club, the board drew attention under Stephenson's reign when it put forth an amendment to its bylaws that read in 1938, a woman's role of honor shall be instituted to which the board of directors may name women of the United States and Canada in recognition of the noteworthy achievements and writings in the field of the club's interests, primarily exploration. That perhaps to comfort fellow members, the article added, this woman's role of honor shall be quite outside the club's organization but shall correspond in dignity to the honorary class of, male, members within it. His continued support of women in anthropology is demonstrated in his 1939-1941 mentorship of Sheetal Steed as she undertook research on diet and subsistence for his two-volume Lives of the Hunters, from which she began a dissertation on hunter-gatherer. While living in New York City, Stephenson was one of the regulars at Romani Marie's Greenwich Village cafes. During the years when he and novelist Fanny Hurst were having an affair, they met there when he was in town. In 1941, he became the third honorary member of the American Polar Society. He served as president of the History of Science Society from 1945-46. In 1940, he met his future wife Evelyn Schwartzbeard at Romani Marie's, Stephenson and Baird married soon after. Legacy Stephenson's personal papers and collection of Arctic artifacts are maintained and available to the public at the Dartmouth College Library. Stephenson is frequently quoted as saying that an adventure is a sign of incompetence. Roald Amundsen stated he was the greatest humbug alive referring to his mismanagement of the Vrongel Island fiascos. On May 28, 1986, the United States Postal Service issued a 22-cent postage stamp in his honor. Political affiliations in the 1930s, pro-Soviet movements were created whose main aim was to provide support for the Soviet project to establish a Jewish Socialist Republic in the Birabidjan region in the far east of the USSR. One of the organizations prominent in this campaign was the American Committee for the Settlement of Jews in Birobidjan, or Ambijan, formed in 1934. A tireless proponent of settlement in Birabidjan, Stephenson appeared at countless Ambijan meetings, dinners, and rallies, and proved an invaluable resource. And by John produced a 50-page yearbook at the end of 1936, 
full of testimonials and letters of support. Among these was one from Stephenson, who was now also listed as a member of Ambi John's Board of Directors and Governors. The Biro Bijan project seems to me to offer a most statesmanlike contribution to the problem of the rehabilitation of Eastern and Central European Jewry, he wrote. And by John's National Conference in New York, November 25 to 26, 1944, pledged to raise $1 million to support refugees in Stalingrad and Birabijan. Prominent guests and speakers included New York Congressman Emanuel Saylor, Senator Albert D. Thomas of Utah, and Soviet Ambassador Andrei Gromyko. A public dinner, attended by the delegates and their guests, was hosted by Vilja Almer and spouse Evelyn Stephenson. Vilhjalmer was selected as one of two vice presidents of the organization. But with the growing anti-Russian feeling in the country after World War II, exposés of Stephenson began to appear in the press. In August 1951, he was denounced as a communist before a Senate Internal Security Subcommittee by Louis F. Budens, a communist turned Catholic. Perhaps Stephenson himself had by then some second thoughts about Ambrosian, for his posthumously published autobiography made no mention of his work on its behalf. Nor, for that matter, did his otherwise very complete obituary in the New York Times of August 27, 1962. Advocacy of an exclusively meat diet Stephenson is also a figure of considerable interest in dietary circles, especially those with an interest in very low-carbohydrate diets. Stephenson documented the fact that the Inuit diet consisted of about 90% meat and fish, Inuit would often go 6 to 9 months a year eating nothing but meat and fish, what might nowadays be perceived to be a zero-carb, no-carbohydrate diet or an extreme version of the ketogenic diet. The diet technically contains a very low amount of carbohydrates as the fresh fish that the Inuit ate would have contained a small amount of glycogen, he found that he and his fellow explorers of European, Negro, and South Sea Islands descent were also perfectly healthy on such a diet. Some years after his first experience with the Inuit, known as Eskimos in Stephenson's time, Dr. Stephenson returned to the Arctic with a colleague, Dr. Karsten Anderson, to carry out research for the American Museum of Natural History. They were supplied with every necessity including a year's supply of civilized food. This they declined, electing instead to live off the land. In the end, the one-year project stretched to four years, during which time the two men ate only the meat they could kill and the fish they could catch in the Canadian Arctic. Neither of the two men suffered any adverse after-effects from their four-year experiment. It was evident to Stephenson, as it had been to William Banting, that the body could function perfectly well, remain healthy, vigorous and slender if it used a diet in which as much food was eaten as the body required, only carbohydrate was restricted and the total number of calories was ignored. While there was considerable skepticism when Stephenson reported his findings about the viability of an exclusively meat diet, his claims have been borne out in later studies and analyses. In multiple studies, it was shown that the Inuit diet was a ketogenic diet. While the Inuit diet derived a percentage of its calories from the glycogen found in the raw meats, the native Inuit ate a diet of primarily stewed, boiled, fish and meats while occasionally eating raw fish. To combat erroneous conventional beliefs about diet, Stephenson and his fellow explorer Karsten Anderson agreed to undertake a study to demonstrate that they could eat a 100% meat diet in a closely observed laboratory setting for the first several weeks. For the rest of an entire year, paid observers followed them to ensure dietary compliance. The book The Unseen Power, Public Relations states that Pendelt and Dudley, once considered the Dean of Public Relations, convinced the American Meat Institute to fund this study. The results were published and Anderson had developed glycosuria during this time, which is normally associated with untreated diabetes. But unlike the pathology of diabetes, in this particular study, glucosuria was present in Anderson for four days and coincided only with the giving of a 100 grams of glucose for a tolerance test and with the first three days of his pneumonia, where he received fluids and a diet rich in carbohydrate. Once that situation resolved, the glucosuria disappeared. At the researcher's request, Stephenson was asked to eat lean meat only. Stephenson noted that in the north, very lean meat sometimes produced digestive disturbances. Whereas Stephenson's prior experience was that lean meat would lead to illness after the second or third fatless week, Stephenson developed nausea and diarrhea on the third day at Bellevue. Stephenson attributes the fast onset of illness due to the usually lean meat that he was served versus the fattier caribou meat he consumed previously. After eating fatty meat, he fully recovered in two days. However, 
The initial disturbance was followed by a period of persistent constipation lasting 10 days. There were no deficiency problems, the two men remained perfectly healthy, their bowels remained normal, except that their stools were smaller and did not smell. Stefan since gingivitis disappeared by the end of the experiment although there was an increase in the deposit of tartar on his teeth. During this experiment his intake had varied between 2,000 and 3,100 calories per day and he derived, by choice, an average of almost 80% of his energy from animal fat and almost 20% from protein. Dot daily intake varied from 100 to 140 grams of protein, 200 to 300 grams of fat, and 7 to 12 grams of carbohydrates. Fat, and 7 to 12 grams of carbohydrates. Fat, and 7 to 12 grams.